keys. They give us access to things. They open doors. They start engines. They give us access to things that without the key, you wouldn't have access to. I'd like you to use your imagination with me this morning. Imagine this afternoon you head home and you get a knock at the door. You're taking your Sunday afternoon nap because you're following my sermon on rest. And uh, someone's there at the door and you, you open it up and you recognize him. Uh, maybe you're not much of a football fan like me or maybe you're a hardcore Patriots fan. But there is Tom Brady standing at the door. All right, you look up and uh, there he is. And uh, he says, hey, I... Uh, I drive by here all the time, and uh, my house is just down, uh, uh, down the road a bit, and I, I've been wanting to meet you. I've been wanting to uh, have you over to my place and, and see my mansion, and uh, so I, I wanted to give you the code to the front gate at my house. And so he gives you the code, and he says, I'm going to put you on the list uh, for the people to come to the house. And actually, he pulls out his keychain and uh, he starts to take a key off. And uh, he takes the key off the keychain and he hands it to you. He says, hey, here's a key to the back door. I want you to come over sometime and have a meal with me. Okay, you'd be a little shocked. But I want you to imagine that this is a real thing that happened. Tom Brady wants to be your friend. I don't care if you, if, you, if you don't know anything about Tom Brady or not, you're going to start looking into Tom Brady. Uh, may, maybe you order a jersey. You, you get the jersey and you wear it. Maybe, maybe you join a fan club on Facebook. And, uh, but you've got a key to his back door. You've got a code to the gate. I want to imagine the scenario that you never go. You, sure, you, you, you wear the jersey and you, sit, you tell all your friends about how he, he came to your door and gave you a key, but you, you never go. You, you hold on to that key. If maybe you polish it. You put it on your shelf. And you think about it a lot. You look at it every day. But you never go. You've got an invitation, and not only that, you've got access to his back door. But you never go. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, we're told that we have access to the most holy place of God. And it is even more preposterous for us to never enter that as it is preposterous for you to never visit Tom Brady's house. You see, we have access to God. And this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what we believe that the grace of God accomplishes at the cross of Jesus. It's that we have access. You see, the Old Testament setup of approaching God was, was a bit structured. If you ever read through Leviticus or uh, some of uh, God's uh, instructions and in numbers, some of these early books in the Bible, when he tells the nation of Israel, okay, here's how you're to approach me. And he gives instructions for the temple, the place where in the Old Testament God dwelt. And so there were courts of the temple. There were different areas. It's, it's like the foyer and the outer courts. You'd, you'd have these outer courts and then you'd have the inner courts. And then at the front of the temple there was a curtain. And behind that curtain God warned no one can go. Because God is so holy. He's so separate than us. And we read in scripture that we all fall short of God. That we all have what we call sin in our lives. Things that are disobedience to the way that God designed us to live. Things that fall short of His character that is perfect and holy, meaning set apart. And so this most holy place 
was separated by a thick curtain. Once a year, the high priest would go through cleansing rituals. There would be animals to be sacrificed. There would be washing with water. And there would be a process for the priest. And he would go into that curtain once a year to make a sacrifice on behalf of the people. And in fact, you know what they did? They would tie a rope around his ankle just in case he were to fall dead there in the presence of God. This was serious business. And one of the things that we see in the Old Testament, and this is, this is why it's important for us to read all of Scripture, because what God is doing there with the nation of Israel is He is teaching us something. That there is only one way to have access to God. And that's His way. There is only one way to have access to God's holiness, and that is that someone is holy, or that there's a sacrifice made on behalf of their sins. And so the whole Old Testament setup is what the writer of Hebrews is using the imagery of when we read, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of God, of Jesus, we have access to the most holy place of God. In fact, in the Gospels, we have the accounts of Jesus' death. It says the darkness covered the land and Jesus had breathed His last breath and we read that the curtain in the temple was torn in two. But here's the thing. Those curtains, they probably uh, stood there in the temple for years, and uh, they, would, they would get frayed at the bottom. You know, they would rub against the floor, and, and, and maybe, maybe that curtain would start to tear from the bottom, but we read in the Gospels that the, tor- that the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. See, God made access through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And this is what grace is. When I talk about the gospel, this is something, this is a word we use. It's a, it's a, it's a word that means good news. When I talk about gospel, this is what we mean by that. It means that through the blood of Jesus, we have access to God. And so, What the writer of Hebrews is doing here is he's building on all of the book of Hebrews is looking at how Jesus gives us access. And here in chapter 10, verse 19, it's a turning point in the book of Hebrews. Um, We have this word, therefore. And whenever we see that, we want to ask, what is it therefore? Because it is connecting us to what came before All of this from chapter 5 all the way through chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews is showing that Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. That the the sacrifices that were once part of the nation of Israel, that is completed in the sacrifice that Jesus made at the cross. Therefore, verse 22, let us draw near to God. If I can simplify that for us this morning... The writer of Hebrews is telling us, you have access to the back door. You've got the code to the gate. Jesus has made the way. He's given you access. Use it. This is, this is what the writer of Hebrews is encouraging you and I with, is that it is as preposterous for you to show up at church to talk about the gospel, to, to go throughout your everyday lives and call yourself a Christian and not use the key. You have access to God, so use it. It says in verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. 
having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. This is the imagery. The, the, the cleansed with blood and washed with water is the imagery that a priest would go through in order to enter that most holy place once a year. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, Jesus has done that for you. If you have put your faith in Jesus, and you've said, I want to follow you and receive your forgiveness for my sins, and I want to follow you with my life, then you have access to this reality that we have confidence before God. And so what the writer of Hebrews does here in this passage is he gives us three things that we have access to. Three things that because we have access, you are to do. And the first is to draw near to God with gospel confidence. You know the number one reason people don't use their gym memberships? because they haven't used their gym membership. You know that? People don't go to the gym because they haven't been going to the gym. Anybody know that reality? I, I, I know that. I, I used to be very into weightlifting, but I haven't lifted weights in years, and I'm scared to do it because I, I haven't done it. And, and, and this morning, we're continuing our series called Healthy Habits. Uh, intentional steps to growing in Jesus. And one of the things that we see is that one of the things that keeps you from putting into practice some of the healthy habits we're talking about is that maybe you haven't been doing it. And you're scared. And you, you feel intimidated by it. Maybe, maybe you feel, and this is something I hear from people all the time, when I talk to people about how their walk with Jesus is doing, they say these words, and you probably feel this from week to week, God just feels distant. I just don't feel near God. And the reality for many of us is that we haven't, let the gospel confidence sink into our hearts that we actually have a key to the back door. That Jesus has made a way. And so the first thing the writer of Hebrews tells us that in light of the access we have through the gospel is that we draw near to God with gospel confidence. And I'll tell you, we don't always feel it. You don't always feel near God, but the writer of Hebrews says draw near anyway. You have access. So so I I want us to lay down the unhealthy habits we've developed of not drawing near to God because we just don't feel it. And I want us to let the gospel realities sink into our hearts that we have confidence. And so gospel confidence is grounded in the reality of of gospel access. It, we have access to God, so we have confidence to approach Him. In fact, the writer of Hebrews uh, uses this image back in chapter 4. He says, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with confidence because He wants to help us in our time of need. Last, the last couple of weeks, we've looked at the healthy habit of prayer. And for many of us, the thing that keeps us from praying is that we haven't been doing it. And so I would encourage you that as we look at these healthy habits, the first step in doing them and putting them into practice is to practice them. To let the reality of the access that we have in the gospel of Jesus sink in. And the gospel doesn't make us fans of God. It makes us family of God. And so it would feel weird for you to show up at Tom Brady's house, enter that code, walk up to the back door, open it, because you're a stranger. But through the gospel of Jesus, you are not a stranger to God. You are his child. And he invites us to draw near. So first, draw near with gospel confidence. And then as the passage goes on in verse 23, he says, let us, there's three let us, phrases here in this passage. Let us draw near. The second is verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope 
we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Okay, so not only do we draw near to God with gospel confidence, but we also hold on to hope with gospel confession. Here's what I mean by that. Confession often has a, this uh, image of, in our minds, especially here in New England, where it's a very uh, Catholic culture of, of going into a, a room and, and, and actually saying your sins to someone. What I mean by gospel confession is, is not this. What I mean is it is professing, it is saying verbally what we believe. And this is what he says. He let us, says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. He doesn't say the hope we possess. He says the hope we profess. And one of the healthy habits I would encourage you to put into practice in light of the access we have through the gospel of Jesus is professing what you believe. And I'm not just talking about... Uh, uh, oh, witnessing or evangelism what i'm talking about is professing the gospel of jesus to yourself preach the gospel to yourself when you do not feel like god is near preach open up hebrews 10 verse 19 and read these words to yourself out loud therefore brothers and sisters that's me since we have confidence I have confidence. I don't, I'm not feeling that right now. Peter, you have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Preach the gospel to yourself. And this is, this is how we hold on to hope because all of you know that life takes unexpected turns. Life is full of messy, broken things because we live in a world that's broken. It's full of the reality of the consequences of, our, of sin that just exists in our world. And, and because of that, life takes these unexpected turns. And, and what the writer of Hebrews is telling us is to hold on to hope unswervingly. But when life is jerking us to the left and jerking us to the right, it's easy to swerve. It's easy to feel like, oh God, I just don't feel it. God, I just don't believe that you're actually here with me. And it's in those moments that we have to preach the gospel to ourselves. Remind ourselves of gospel truth, that you have access to God, so draw near. So we draw near to God with gospel confidence. We hold on to hope with gospel confession. And here is where I think the writer of Hebrews is taking us in verse 24. He says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. The third thing that we do in light of the access that we have through the gospel of Jesus, is that we live out our mission in gospel community. We live out our mission in gospel community. The, the movement of this passage starts with, start with gospel confidence, actually draw near to God. And then when you, when you go through those seasons where you need to just hold on to hope, Preach the gospel to yourself. Remind yourselves of gospel truth. Use gospel confession as part of your holding on to hope. And, and the reality is this is hard. And we need each other. And this is where the movement of the passage goes, is that in order for us to live this out, we need gospel community. And this is, this is a word that I, I'd like for us to kind of uh, cement in our minds as, um, as the same as the church. When we talk about the church, I'd like us to think gospel community. When we think uh, the body of Christ, I'd like us to think gospel community. Because what this, what this is, I've said the gospel is that we have access to God 
And community is where we do that together. And so what the writer of Hebrews is telling us is we need to develop a habit of encouraging one another, of moving each other toward using our access to God to drawing near to God. We need one another. And he says in verse 25, not giving up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And I, I come to this passage not as like a guilt trip to show up to church. This is an encouragement to show up in each other's lives outside of Sunday morning. This is what gospel community is. Gospel community is saying, I'm not only committed to my relationship with Jesus, I'm committed to yours. I'm not only committed to the access that I have through faith, I'm committed to helping my friend, my neighbor, my uh, church member who is walking through the thick of the hard things of life and they don't feel near God right now. So you know what? I'm going to go into God's presence with them. This word that that the writer of Hebrews uses when he says, let us consider, I I think this English translation is a little soft because the same word is translated um, provoke. it's, it's, It's the same word that's used of provoking someone to anger. This is something that is actually uh, uh, putting myself in someone else's life where, you know what, I might even get on their nerves. But I am so committed to encouraging one another toward the mission that we have. We have a mission. We've looked at that this morning in our service. That the church is grounded in a mission. And you cannot separate gospel access from gospel mission. You can't separate the reality that we have been saved by the blood of Jesus from the reality that we have a mission to spread the good news that there is hope. And so we draw near to God with gospel confidence. We hold on to hope with gospel confession. And we live out our mission in gospel community. And I want to encourage us that we need to develop better habits of meeting together. And maybe it's coming out to refuel on Wednesday nights. Maybe it's just saying, hey, I'd like to have you over for dinner so that we can pray together. I know you're going through a really hard season right now, and I just want to pray for you. And I want to approach God boldly because we both have access to God. Maybe it's uh, it's showing up to to the movie night on August 17th when we are going to live out our mission to, to reach out to our friends and neighbors. And let me tell you, I, I, the people that were there yesterday who worked uh, their booties off to uh, spread popcorn and love and joy, uh, they can probably uh, say this morning that there is something uniquely unifying about serving together. Wouldn't you say, Mike? Like, that is something uniquely unifying about standing shoulder to shoulder to accomplish the same mission. And this is what gospel community is about. And there's one final phrase that ends this passage. And he says, all the more. He's encouraging us to, to meet together. To not uh, neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. All the more as you see the day approaching. We look at our world, it's full of brokenness. We look at our, the lives of our family, our friends, there's hurt, there's pain, there's, there's a longing for redemption. And Jesus has promised that one day he will return and he will wipe every tear from our eyes and he will make all things new. And part of that hope is the reality for us as believers in Jesus, is the the timing for us, the urgency to share the hope, to share the joy, to live out our mission, because we know that day is coming. And we want people to experience the redemption that is coming. And so it gives us an urgency to not only draw near to God, to hold on to our hope in God, but to 
consider, to, to actually think about this week. I want you to be intentional. I want you to sit down and take some time and say, how can I encourage someone toward the mission of the gospel of Jesus? I want us to make a habit of that because part of being a gospel community is being a community that is committed to the habit of encouraging one another toward love and good deeds. We need each other. As we draw near to God and we hold on to hope, we need gospel community. So brothers and sisters, you have access to God. Use it. Together, let us draw near to God. Let us hold on to hope. And let us spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for this word. Oh, how I need it. Would you move in our hearts to start developing some habits of encouraging one another of spurring one another on toward the gospel realities that we experience. And so, God, I pray for any who are listening to this sermon who've, who've never received that access to your throne uh, simply by putting their faith. I, I pray for any who, who don't have that gospel confidence that they would look to the cross where you paid the penalty for our sin and you offer forgiveness and they would say, Lord, I pray that they would even pray this morning, Lord, I receive the gift of your forgiveness and I want to follow you and I want to draw near and I want to live in the gospel realities that we have access to the Father through Jesus. And Lord, we thank you. I pray that we would draw near to you this week, even when we don't feel it. But we'd make the habits, the intentional steps to draw near to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.